So in the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about uh, what I call real-time simulation for a product in production, meaning the product is actually in service, and you're doing simulation on the product itself and, and use that data to make a decision while the product is in production. So the way we're going to do that is first we're going to talk about Riskel for uh, just briefly for two minutes to give you an overview about Riskel. Then we're going to zoom into a uh, different uh, evolution in the, in the simulation space and looking into the product life cycle. That's going to help us to explain what do we mean by uh, product in service, what does it fit in the product life cycle. Then we're going to zoom into uh, examples of simulations uh, in live. And at the end of the session, which is going to be the bulk of this, uh, of this session, we're going to talk about a specific use case for a Formula One uh, company, uh, which is uh, uh, leveraging simulation to define a race strategy while in the race. So that's a very fun topic, and I promise you it's going to be interesting if you uh, um, stay for the whole session. So uh, Riskel um, is based in San, based in San Francisco. Uh, it was founded by uh, two engineers from Boeing, truly an engineering company building uh, products for the engineers. I'm actually coming from the software space. I'm almost the only one, plus some other people with, from the software uh, space. The, the others are from the engineering space. The two engineers actually worked on uh, 787 uh, wing design. Uh, not sure if you know, but uh, there was the 787 wing design. They only did about 11 uh, physical uh, tests and compared to the 767 where they did 70 plus uh, physical tests. That was a great success for, for simulation. And the goal we have is to uh, connect the public cloud uh, with simulations to enable engineers to innovate and move uh, things faster to the market. So, Riskel uh, has a partnership with about 120 software packages. I think you heard uh, all, of, uh, all of the different vendors talking about that, uh, which means if you come to the Riskel cloud, you will find the software, you will find the license. You can bring your own license. You can use uh, an on-demand license. It's all provisioned, different versions. Uh, we also integrate with multiple data centers. Um, great, uh, great session today by Microsoft and by Amazon showing about the progress coming up in the cloud. Um, the reality is that it's not all size fit all for all the different software simulations. Customers need simulations for uh, a specific simulation might require a specific hardware in a specific location. And the variety of uh, multiple data centers gives you that uh, flexibility. Our engineering team is built of uh, PhDs coming from uh, CFD, FEA, uh, life science uh, experts. And together with the, with the software development team, they build a workflow uh, which is it's a web-based workflow uh, to be able to actually use the simulation on the cloud and use that. And for IT, of course, you can configure everything, you can manage the usage, and it's, uh, it has uh, multiple layers of uh, security. So let's talk about simulation for a second. Um, we see our customers pushing the limits on different, different verticals, different areas. Uh, in the aerospace, we just had a customer for UEV design. They did almost a billion sales in CFD, pretty amazing. Uh, when you look into oil and gas, and I think, uh, I think David from uh, Amazon touched about it a bit before, we see customers capturing data from uh, quality sensors, using that back uh, into the design uh, to, to figure out uh, how to drill, where to drill. Um, when you look into life science, and we heard all of the machine learning exercises in the morning, that's even more complex. Uh, customers that need to do, uh, that are using scientific methods for uh, um, for a, a drug and protein the interaction binding, those are pretty complex. And even with today cloud and local HPC, uh, it's hard to do. If we zoom into the automotive space, right, back from the years of, uh, of uh, vehicle dynamics done by uh, uh, analog computing, today things are really boosting uh, all the way up. Uh, we see customers in all the different disciplines, CFD, FEA, doing ensemble analysis, uh, high fidelity uh, composition, and high fidelity uh, elements. And, uh, and really stretching the limits uh, of the space. But at the end of the day, all of those are being done in design, right? So if you look into this, into this uh, process of, uh, the very simplistic process of the product lifecycle, um, most of the simulations today are done in design when I'm trying to uh, do a design before I actually go and build the, the manufacturing. In the manufacturing process itself, you still use simulation a lot, right, to understand how the manufacturing process is going to work, to make sure you have the right predictability and tools in place, and, uh, and that's great. We do see customers capturing data from uh, 
uh, prototypes and again pushing that back into simulation. But what I want to talk about in this session uh, and drill down on that is an example of doing simulations when the product is in service, meaning the wing is already on the plane, you're actually flying that wing, and you want to make simulations on that uh, specific product while it's in service. So let's look into some examples uh, of, uh, of doing simulation in service. And I broke it on, on the time spectrum because I think that's the best way to kind of like understand what we mean by simulation in service and how they actually divide uh, over time. So um, we have a customer who is uh, uh, running a, a fleet of, uh, of helicopters. Um, they capture data from uh, sensors from the helicopters. Those are being transferred into uh, a simulation tool. Based on that simulation tool, they can make decisions about when to do maintenance, how to do maintenance, they can find abnormal, abnormal activity. The time, the time difference is about you know, days, weeks from the time they actually capture the data and make a decision. Uh, the example we're going to talk about later in specific details would be the F1, a use case of, Man, of Mano. So they actually uh, run simulation while in the race in every lap. And based on those results, they can make decisions about the race strategy in the race itself. There was a lot, there was a lot of uh, discussion in the morning about, about uh, deep and machine learning, an exciting, an exciting space. Um, so just recently, uh, uh, the, for the first time, a machine was able to win uh, a, a player in a Go. So Go is a very uh, complicated game. For those who don't know, it's, it's kind of like take chess, but just multiply it by a lot. Um, so the machine was able to, uh, uh, to, the computer was able to win a, a chess 20 years ago, in the case of Kasparov. Uh, Google just did that on March with, uh, with AlphaGo. A uh, really interesting way to see how simulation is used in live. And the way that the Alpha, the, the Go game works is actually each player gets some, like in the beginning of the game, they have like a limited amount of time that they can use. So let's say they have an hour to use for each, for each uh, step they want to do. Once they finish that one hour, then they have a number of seconds to respond to the next move. And at that point, the simulation really needs to respond to the next move in a pretty much short period of time. It's really interesting when you, when you drill down to those examples, for example, the, the advantage that you know, the person had, uh, Lee Soder in this case, he could change the strategy between one game to the other. The machine couldn't because to actually go and train the machine on a new strategy based on the previous game, they need to send it back to the lab and wait for like three weeks for it to do the training and then do the game back again. So really interesting stuff. Um, and then you go to microseconds, right? In the case of, of, uh, of autonomous cars, last week I attended the GTC uh, 2016 at the video conference. I highly recommend if anybody has the time, go and watch the uh, uh, keynote from Gil Parrott. Really, really exciting stuff about autonomous cars. Uh, interesting to see how uh, there are different paths over there. One is uh, the car as a guardian angel, meaning um, the car and the driver are going to simulate and, and actually drive on the same time, and the car intervenes only when it needs to, while the, the one more challenging one is the car is kind of like the chauffeur, drives all the time. Uh, and needs, to, uh, and needs to respond all the time and manage the things all the time. And that's really hard when your resources are local, local on the car, right? Because you can't really use the cloud for that. So different examples. Uh, and we're going to zoom into uh, our use case right now. So that's the Formula One use case. So Formula One, I'm going to share some nice facts about Formula One. I, I actually learned about the space about three months ago when Formula One, when uh, Mano Racing gave us the phone call and we were trying to figure out if we can help them. Um, so Formula One, few interesting things, right? They took everything to kind of like extreme. So it takes them three seconds to change, to change, uh, change tires on the pit stop. Like 14 people are doing that. Um, another interesting thing, uh, every, on every, um, every time you change a tire, the tire is losing almost half a kilo uh, of the weight just from the race itself. Um, another interesting thing, they have about 100 kilometers of wire within the car just for sensors and, feel, and things like that. So they took everything for the extreme. Uh, but what we want to talk about specifically uh, on this use case is the race strategy, meaning how do you manage your race? How do you decide where to stop, which tiles to replace? And for that, I want to show you a quick, uh, a quick movie uh, that talks about uh, kind of like the team behind the scenes I'm 
My name is William Courtney. I'm the Head of Race Strategy here at Infinity Red Bull Racing. My primary role is to travel to all the races to make recommendations in terms of the strategies that we're going to follow during the race, how many pit stops we're going to make, when we're going to make them, what tyres we're going to fit. And I'm also managing the team that are based here back in Milton Keynes. And they provide information support to me, which gets fed to the track side to help us understand how we're competing relative to our rivals. Well, Spa is, is quite unique in that it's got a very long lap length. And the result of that means that there's fewer laps than there is at any other race. So from a strategy point of view, you've obviously got fewer laps in which you can make your pit stop choices. And if you decide that you're going to defer and wait until the next lap, that's obviously another big step further into the race compared to other circuits where there's more laps. So you've got fewer choices, but the choices you do have to make are more significant. Spa is pretty unique, both in terms of the terrain, the weather that we go to. It makes it very tricky sometimes to work with the weather. We might be sat in the pit wall and it would be completely dry, and the drivers are telling us that it's raining hard at turn five, which obviously we can't see and we're relying on their judgment. We can only see half the story and we need the driver's feedback to help us make that decision. A successful weekend for me is perhaps a little more unusual compared to some of the other people on the team. I think the absolute outcome is not necessarily the deciding factor for me, it's how we've performed relative to our potential. And I think that for me is the biggest measure of success in my particular role. But obviously you still want to win races as a team. So um, what we've seen over here is the challenge that this team has behind the scenes to really support uh, the car, right? They have to decide many different things, like where to, where to do the pit stop, which tiles to, to actually change, um, on which laps they want to do that. And the fact is that they have a team back in their office supporting them, uh, in this case in the UK. Are you able to do that or not yet? Yeah, I'm just trying to find where your slide deck is. So uh, let's look into an example of, um, of a race. And there will be on this slide, it's a bit kind of like complex, but um, so this is actually a, 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 PD, a, a scan of a page in, in a magazine. It's in Japanese. One of our developers who is uh, really eager about F1 is a Japanese guy, and I couldn't actually find this kind of example in, on the web in English. But what you can see over here, and this race was just done in Australia, the last one, the, it's the one before the last one. So each, uh, each, uh, each column over here is a car. So this car actually got to the first place. And each rectangle over here, that's a pit stop. So this car did two pit stops, one on the 12th lap and one on the 18th lap. Uh, now, they also give you uh, three types of tires that you can choose in each Formula One race. So it's usually three types, and the, there is the hardest one, then the one in the middle, and then the softest one. And the hardest one, they are actually performing not the best in the beginning, but then over time they're performing better because they have better degradation. The softest one, they're pretty good to start with from a performance perspective, but they have higher, higher degradation, right? So the team needs to decide how to, how to really rotate those. So you can clearly see that everybody's doing something else, right? I mean, the, 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 the team that won, they started with the red one, which is super soft. They then on the 12th lap changed to uh, the yellow one, which is soft. And then uh, at the 18th lap, they moved to the hard one, which actually allowed them to uh, finish the race because that's the hard one that can, be, that, can take you for, that can take you through the race, right? But it's pretty obvious everybody, everybody's doing something different. There is no clear answer. Each one of those teams is making different decisions, right? So how do you actually make those decisions and how can simulation help you on that in the race? So we partner with uh, Menno Racing. Um, it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, uh, F1 team, very agile, very innovative. Um, the team is built from uh, guys that came from uh, Ferrari from, uh, uh, and from different teams. Uh, and they build a software, they build a custom software to actually go and manage that uh, process uh, in the race. And so far they've been using it not, in the, not, during, the ri not, not, not during the race, but uh, before the race. And the challenge was, can we actually use that in the race? Um, so these are the goals they have, right? It's pretty simple. Where do I stop? In which, in which kind of like uh, pit stops? Which tire do I change? How do I know when to go back into the race in what specific location? Those are the things that they're trying to figure out to eventually try to get advantage on the race. So who are the users? Uh, the top user is the race director. Uh, he is really the one making the decisions. And then the actual user of the software is the head of vehicle science, uh, this guy, James, James, uh, James. 
He's a great guy, you know, knows the software inside out and, and really understand the whole simulation space. So when you do simulation for a product that is in service, you have to think about time. Now, time is important in general, right? Even when you do design for, uh, for a simulation, it's very important. We always pitch that from a time to market perspective. But in this case, you have to think about many more parameters to actually make it happen. Uh, the first thing is how do I actually capture the data from the system? How do, I, how do I input that into my application? Then how do I upload that to the, to the cluster? I need to find the best cluster to really have the best performance. I then need to download the data, capture it back into my uh, application, render the data for results, and really use them. All of those things are things that we had to figure out of the manual team and make sure that we actually support them uh, in the best way. So we built up a, a, a special cluster for them. Uh, we tuned a bit uh, our system to really make sure it's, uh, it's uh, much more uh, agile from a speed perspective. But it's a, it's a very common one when we have a, a, head, a head node which interacts uh, over VPN with the uh, PC that is based in, on the track side. Uh, and then that head node actually interacts with multiple nodes on the cloud to run, uh, to run the simulation. And the way it works is that in the beginning, they put many input parameters, right? The weather, uh, uh, how long is the lap, um, different types of tires, what are the degradation of the tires, many, many parameters that they put into the system. And then they run the simulation. So they run the simulation, and after one minute, they have results, right? Or one and a half minutes, they have results, because the lap usually takes between a minute and a half to two minutes. Then they can make a decision because if they have some results or they just put real data into the system of the actual results of the actual situation of the, of the driver right now, and they run the simulation again. And then another minute goes by, another minute and a half, and they get results and they can make a decision, or they can just continue and do that. But the point is that they have the advantage of having the best accuracy in the results as long as they use the latest data from the, uh, uh, from the time of, of uh, from the race itself and from the current time. So how do I collect the data? Um, the data is being um, generated from uh, the user uh, PC. They put the information. It's actually a pretty small uh, file. This data is then being uploaded to the cluster, to the head node. Um, so si the size of the data is actually pretty small. So that was very easy for us to uh, uh, manage all of that. It goes to the head node. The head node then go, then go and distribute that to the, to the server. Um, and uh, the question we had to figure out, okay, how do we make sure that we're going to uh, support that under 50 seconds, right? So every lap, again, takes between a minute and a half to two minutes. Uh, so everything has to come back under 50 seconds. And we did a, a very lengthy benchmark to support that. The actual table is probably two or three times bigger. I just, uh, just shared some of them. Uh, and the questions that you play with are, one, the user needs, meaning the number of strategies they want to run, the permutations they want to have, and the iterations, which really helps them to get more and more variety on the choices. On the other hand, how many cars do you want to have and how many cars? So the team has two cars. Eventually, we landed on having 750 cars per car, um, and we were able to achieve that under 35 seconds in this specific, uh, specific case. So how do they use that? Um, so they sit in the race, and this is actually a screenshot of, of the Rescale uh, platform. Uh, what you can see over here, um, so it's a 1,500 calls. This is kind of the UI of Rescale. You choose the type of application, Menno. This is the hardware you're using. Um, this is uh, the configuration. Um, and they're actually running 3,000 tasks, so two tasks per one of those nodes, which means they have a lot of results uh, to use and to decide upon. So the results. Uh, and the next slide, actually, I'll show you specifically how they get the results and how they make a decision. But the results are, again, pretty small, five megabytes. Those are uh, coming up on the head node. They are then being downloaded to the uh, GUI application of, of Meno, and then the, the Meno application really shows them the results so they can make a decision. Uh, so another complex chart. I think it's uh, simpler than what we had in the morning, so bear with me, but uh, I'll explain that. Um, so, and this is the actual charts that they get. So, so basically, to remind you, they get uh, three types of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of tires, right? From the hardest to the softest. And they always name them. Prime is the hardest, option is the middle one, and alternate is the softest one. They always just name them to that. Actually, F1 gives 
And they have five or six of those, and then on every race, they just choose three, and they tell them you have to use those, those three. And everybody has to use the same thing for even play between the different uh, teams. So every line over here is actually a strategy. Uh, you can see many lines here that really are not that important. So, um, so let's look into the example of, of this line. This is actually the line that uh, is the best on this chase. So on this choice. So this line, what it basically says, you want to start with P, which is prime. So you start your race with a prime. On the 19 lap, you're going to change to option. And then on the 30, 38 lap, you're going to change to option again. That's what really this uh, scenario tells you. Um, and the reason that you want to actually use this one is because the y-axis over here, that's the time difference, right? So this is, it's normalized to the bottom, which means whatever strategies you have, the ones that actually touch the bottom are the ones that you want to, that you want to use, right? Um, so there are actually two of those over here, right? There is this guy and there is this guy. And if we look into this guy based on the color, uh, this one is, is this strategy. So this strategy tells you to start with option on the 17 uh, lap, change to option again. Uh, and then on the uh, 34 lap, change to alternate and then change again to alternate at the 45 lap and just finish the race uh, this way. So the race director is getting two options, right? And he can decide which ones he wants to choose. Clearly the one with the three stops, um, the one with the three stops, um, uh, is getting to the end of the same time. So he can just make a decision and compensate on the time difference by having different type of tiles uh, to use in the race. Um, and uh, all of those things that are coming over here, there are actually thousands of those different uh, samples which are coming back from the Monte Carlo analysis which they are doing, uh, but eventually they just choose, uh, just to choose two of them. Just, they can just choose, choose two of them. Um, so Riskel, uh, we're all about, you know, the innovation. We're all about making it easy for engineers uh, to kind of like break the wall and do, uh, uh, do the new stuff. Uh, this was a great challenge for us to be able to scale for, uh, for, uh, uh, for be able to scale to uh, actually a lifetime decision making using a simulation. Um, so thank you for the time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Are there any questions? Arno? That's a good question. So F1 actually they have put many regulations in place uh, on different areas. Uh, they don't, they don't uh, force you on the number of cores. They do put uh, a limit on number of CFD simulations you can do. And they do put uh, regulations. Those are actually new from 2014 and also the number of wind tunnels, uh, physical wind tunnels you can test. They actually reduce that by almost a third, uh, just to make it an even play, because the rich uh, teams, they can just do lots of simulations, and the ones that don't have too much money, they can't do all of them. Uh, but yes, so yes. But on the number of calls. Yes, please. You want to give him the mic on? Doug Ball? Yeah. I can help. So I'm going to make an assumption. You can tell me if it's right or wrong, but during a race, they're not running CFD. The simulation assumes a certain amount of downforce as a function of speed, and that the simulations is really just dealing with the mechanical aspects and the grip of the tires and that kind of thing, and <clears throat> updating that. They're not looking at the, at the ability to change the configuration of the car. No, that, you're totally correct. Right? That's not a CFD simulation. This is really a... They are using Monte Carlo for that, and they are just running a lot of different uh, strategies. And based on the input that they have, they make a decision for which strategy is the best. So the CFD simulation usually happens in design, uh, on the car itself, uh, on the, before you actually build your car, um, and not, not while in the race. Yeah. Is, is there a limit to the support, the number of people that can be involved in supporting the race, either on site or like off site back at? back at the home office, but they're, you know, interneted in? You know, you are stretching the limits of my, of my knowledge on F1. I have to admit, I learned a lot about F1, and I'm going to attend one of those things, uh, but I just don't know. I mean, what I do know is that it was really impossible to do uh, these kind of things while in race without, without cloud HPC. Um, I've talked to one team,
I've, I've talked to some F1 teams. There's a max number of people that could be trackside. There's a limit, but everybody can be back at home base looking at it on TV and getting computer readings and stuff. And it's for them, it's the most exciting day of the week, obviously. Okay, uh, Zach, thank you. Thank you.